Okay, so this is the last notes for this section, okay? Um, as I was telling you guys, the last page of section three, which is the uh, types of propaganda. Uh, I believe your sophomore year of English, you guys studied this? They're all Okay, so there are going to be these, uh, some of these in the matching questions on the next test. So you will need to be able to differentiate, say, between bandwagon and testimonial, that sort of thing. Okay? So you've got some time. The test is likely to be Tuesday. Okay? So, well, here's the deal. I'm going to finish tomorrow. So I'm going to start Section 4 on Friday. Monday will be a review day, okay, for Section 3. And then we'll take the test on Tuesday. It's either that or a Monday test. I'm down with the original. You're going on the uh, zoo? Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. How many people are going to the zoo? I opted out. Did you really just yeah. <laughs> So we'll figure something out on that. I wasn't kidding. Okay. Uh, we'll figure that out. We'll cross that bridge. All right. So uh, that was page actually. Uh, I don't know what page it is. 71. 71. Okay. Now. That being said, the last thing we're going to talk about is polling. Uh, let me take a poll. You understand polling? Okay. Uh, one of my. I can't see what you're saying. Okay, guys, hard hard to teach when you're talking. Okay. Um, one of. Uh, so you keep talking, Jack. Yeah. Come on. I'm going to start kicking people out. Uh, huh? You ready? Yeah. You ready to sit in the hallway? What? You ready to sit in the hallway? Oh, I thought you were saying like ready for like class. No, I was ready and you kept talking. What? I'm ready for class. <laughs> now when I, you know, when I took math classes in high school and college, um, the class that I probably enjoyed more than any in college math-wise, which is not much, it was statistics. Okay. Uh, when you when you study business, that's one of the classes you're going to have to take if you study business. And there's a real practical use to statistics. And when you talk about polling, uh, statistics are important. Now, I pull up this website here, uh, realclearpolitics.com. This, this website gets a ton of hits during election time. You know, as we build up to a presidential election or gubernatorial midterm elections that we're about to get into this year, okay? What they do is what they're really famous for is uh, tracking polls, okay? And so if I click on this, if I click on this, oh, maybe. What is the deal? <laughs> maybe. Did you try to turn it over? Holy cow. It's a fake, things are fake link. Just like the Alaska. The big page. Yeah. And try to refresh it. Yeah. What in the world? Refresh it. Refresh it. Look, you have the real news to put in the world. Now, BuzzFeed. Do that here? The Young Jerks. Where's the refresh? Oh, right here. No, it's not even Maybe your browser is. Uh, yeah, maybe my browser stinks. You four. I bet Mr. Red R uses four. He says he has four, but does not have four. Okay. Oh. Firefox is not responding. Right, I'm gonna let that sit for a minute. Oh, why do you? Thank you. Yeah, you took what freshman year? Yeah. Okay. So, what I want you to write down are characteristics of a good poll. Characteristics of a good poll. Poll. P O L L. Okay. Now, steel. Let's give me a little history here. Um, if you go back to 1948, and the presidential election between Harry Truman and Thomas Dewey, almost all the polls showed Dewey ahead. And when people went to bed that night, on election night. Uh, most people thought Dewey was going to be the president. 
Uh, the Chicago Sun Times printed the headline, Dewey defeats Truman. But when people got up in the morning and the votes had been counted, Truman had won the election. And people were astonished by that because all the polls showed that Dewey was going to win. Well, 1948, the telephone had been something that a lot of people had by 1948, the landline. And, but what we found out is that more Republicans had telephone than Democrats. So when you take a poll, it has to be truly random. To be a really good poll, it needs to be random. This has become extremely difficult in 2018. And I'm just going to I'm going to expose that by asking this question. I'm going to take a poll. How many of you guys at your house do not have a landline any longer? Do not have a landline. 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 Okay, that's half the class does not have a landline. Your cell phones are not in the phone book. Okay, so you, your chances of being called for a poll, who are you going to vote for, for governor in 2018? You're not going to get polled most likely. So this is making it very different, difficult for polling companies to get accurate polls. Okay. So they're really changing their methodology about how to do this. If you were to do an online poll, okay, it would really, like if you went to a conservative website and they did an online poll, how skewed would that be? It would be very skewed. If you go to MSNBC or CNN and do a poll there online. Fair balance would be right, obviously. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna be a good poll. So how do we get these good polls? Well, the reality is, guys, it's becoming more and more challenging to do so. Okay, now if this will open, which I believe it is going to, okay, just, just to give you an example right here. These polls just today or yesterday, this poll by Rasmussen Reports shows Trump with an approval rating of 51%, the highest it's ever been. But this other poll taken at the same time shows a 10-point difference in approval. You see, you see, the difficulty here lies, and we'll we'll dig into the the methodology here in a minute. The difficulty lies in knowing which of these polls is done well and which is not. Okay, or are either one of them good polls? All right. So if we go back to 2016 in the presidential election, going into that election, okay, almost everybody thought that Hillary was going to win. Almost all the polls showed Hillary winning. Okay? Very few had Trump winning. If any. Yeah, maybe one. Okay? So how'd they get it wrong? Well, the methodology's not good. Times are changing. So these companies are trying to keep up. So um, <coughs> this is the most common problem with polls. Is the, not the ran, not having randomness that every sector of the population has an equal chance of being polled. Every person has an equal chance, and that just is not the case. Tristan, one of the <coughs> hypotheses for the the reason that all the Trump polls were skewed was a lot of them were done face to face, and people were ashamed. For face -to -face. You're you're absolutely right, and also okay. Um, People were afraid to, to admit that they were voting for Trump. Some people were probably afraid to admit they were voting for Hillary. But I would say more on the Trump side for sure. Okay, People just don't feel comfortable with it because of the names that Trump is being called. He's being called a racist, a bigot, a, a nationalistic uh, you know, fascist and so forth, right? So people don't want to be associated with those terms, but that's what you're hearing in the popular media. So people are like, I don't want to, I don't want people to know I support him. Exit polling is done the day of the election. Exit polling. So when people come out of voting, out of the voting, there's people asking them, who did you vote for? And what were the most important issues for you in this election? Was it immigration? Was it the economy? Was it the national debt? Was it the environment? What's the most important issues to you in this election? Okay, so exit polling tends to be a little bit more accurate, but to go with what Tristan said, people coming out of the polling place, 
may not want to tell somebody how they voted. Are Republicans less likely to want to talk to an exit pollster than Democrats? I don't know. What about cell phones? Are people that don't have landlines more likely to be Democrats or Republicans? I don't know. Generally, it's the younger generation that doesn't have the landline. Younger generation tends to be more Democratic. So do you have to, when doing your polling, have to take that into consideration? Okay? So uh, it's, it's just hard to get it right these days. There was probably, in the 70s and early 80s, a day where you could do pretty good polls and know that you were going to get a, a pretty good idea of what you were looking for. But I think that day's over. As I'll show you some of the methodology here in a minute. Now, another characteristic of, of a good poll is that it asks a clear, concise question. Okay, let me give you an example. If I were to ask you guys this in a poll, call me on the phone, and I ask you this question. Does it seem possible or impossible to you that the Nazi extermination of the Jews never happened? Impossible. What? So 6% of respondents said that the Holocaust never happened. Now, a, a, a better view of that, if you were to do a good poll on that, you might have 1% or 2% of the population that would deny the Holocaust happened, but not 6%. Okay? Now, if you're, if you're doing the poll in Palestine, okay, or on the Gaza Strip or somewhere there, you, you might get a lot bigger number. Okay? But you, you see what I mean? Palestine doesn't exist. Okay. What was that, Tristan? <coughs> so, interprets, you got to interpret the responses accurately and so forth. Okay? So, if we look at these um, discrepancies here, now I'm not going to use this poll here. But I'm going to use a, uh, a Senate race here. We'll look at the Pennsylvania Senate race, OK? Uh, Bob Casey is running for re-election against Barletta, OK? This shows Casey up by 18, OK? So let's open this poll, OK? We're going to look at the methodology here. Uh, if I can find the methodology right here, I believe. I have to go to the end. They asked a bunch of questions. Okay. Um, if I, yeah, so these are these are demographics of the people they contacted. Uh, wait a second. Maybe it's at the very end. Oh, come on. Can you go to the top page and see the image? Can you click control F? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. Go out there. Here. Control. Well, but I guess if I No, it's, it's in this paragraphs. Hang on. I'll what get it. What are you looking for? The methodology. Oh, just use the whole landline. It's here. It's here. Control F. <laughs> right here. Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. So. This is a, a college uh, that is putting on this poll in Pennsylvania to see who's going to win the Senate election. Okay, so uh, interviews were conducted by this group. Okay, the data included in this responses of 423 registered voters. Now, are these registered voters likely to vote in the upcoming election? No, they're not likely voters. They're registered voters. So what this is telling us, this they included 201 Democrats, 163 Republicans, and 58 independents. Now that demographically for Pennsylvania, there probably are more registered Democrats than Republicans in Pennsylvania. We know President Trump won Pennsylvania as a Republican. Okay. So uh, they said sample registered voters obtained from this list. Sample response were notified by letter about the survey, and then interviews were completed over the phone and online depending on the respondent's preference. Okay? Survey results were weighed 
Uh, weighted age, gender, education, ideology, and party registration using and iterative weighted algorithm to reflect known distribution of those characteristics reported by the Pennsylvania Department of State and Pennsylvania exit polls. Our sampling error was plus or minus 6.8%. So they're saying that Casey's lead of 18 points is accurate up to 6.8% plus or minus. Is that a very accurate poll? No. I no. It. Now, there is a formula that you can use to get this margin of error. Okay, so you go square root one over the square root of the sample size. You're going to need to know this for the test. What? Yeah. Yes, we are doing cross curricular learning here. Ooh. Math and government class, once again. That's it? Just one over the square root of the sample? Yes, so. Um, does anybody have a calculator? Let's put 500 in here. We're going to survey 500 people. Come on. Okay, listen. It's point four. Point oh four seven. No, 0. 0.0447. <laughs> it's too far. 0. 0.0447. So we round that up to 4.5% four four plus or minus 4.5% for 500 people. Now, when I was in business school, I majored in marketing. And one of my classes, I had to do this. I had to do a poll. I had to call people out of the phone book at random. Now, how many people do you think I had to call before I got one to answer my poll? 15. Yeah. 21. Now we have caller ID. Nine. When I was in college, we didn't have caller ID. Oh, so two. So people were answering the phone. So these companies, <clears throat> like Rasmussen and others, they have to pay telemarketers to make these phone calls. Wichita is famous for having phone centers because people in Wichita don't have an accent. We don't talk like people in Minnesota or Wisconsin or New York, or we don't have a southern accent, right? We just have a normal accent. So that's why they have call centers in Wichita, because you're normal. Okay. When I moved here from Florida, I had a southern accent. It's gone. Now I talk like you. That's right. You miss it. The southern accent. I used to use y'all all the time. Y'all. Now it's you guys. What are y'all doing down here? What about you and? <laughs> <laughs> now I do still use some southern terminology, but yeah. Isn't it though like if we went out of the country, people still think we speak like super southern twang or something like that? In Wichita? Well, like if we went out In of the Canada. Country, like people think Americans like that's like all all Americans speak or something like that. Um. I don't know. I mean, if you're from Minnesota, and up there, it's, it's they have a different alert. And people from Texas. Now, the southern accent from Texas is different than the southern accent from Georgia. Okay? They're different. Okay? And you can tell the difference when you hear them talking. Okay? Florida, Florida, Texas. Florida, Georgia, and uh, Texas. Oh, yeah. Florida is a... Is a is a and melting have you seen that, have you seen that video of the reporter in Augusta, Georgia? Maybe. Oh, it's so funny. Wait, is that, is that what I'm thinking? Yeah. Is that what I'm thinking? Okay. <laughs> All right, now, so let's say, let's say this polling company had to call 1,500 people to get 500 people to answer the phone and take the poll. That costs money. Okay, so let's up this to a thousand and see how much better of a poll we get. Why don't we just pull the whole country? Three point two percent. Why don't you just do Facebook ads? 
this is what you're going to see with most polls. It's about 3%. If it's 3%, because you could go to 5,000, and you're going to only improve by about one and a half points. Okay, if you go to a 5,000. So they're not going to spend all that money to call 15,000 people to get 5,000 respondents. They're going to stop at 800, 900, 1,000. This one only went 423. It's not a very good poll. Okay, but Bob Casey from Pennsylvania is probably going to get reelected. He's the incumbent, which means running for reelection, and he's fairly popular. He's probably going to get reelected. Okay, um, so there's you there's say the majority of these polls are student led. No, Rasmussen is one of the most uh, no you know <coughs> reputable. Um, so who pays these people to take those polls? Rasmussen. How do they get money? How does Rasmussen get money? And they sell the data to uh, political sell, campaigns. They sell Spanish ads. To Cox. On their home page. They sell Spanish. <coughs> Cox is paying for it. They're in it with Cox. Now, this is a tracking poll, and they're asking, guys, what they're doing with tracking polls could be pretty good. And this was one of the best polls for the last presidential election was a tracking poll where they took a, a group of like 500 people and they asked them every every day or every week the same question. Who are you going to vote for? Who are you going to vote for? And so forth. Okay. And they tracked that over time through the campaign. Okay. So that became a fairly accurate because, you know, news stories come out, you know, scandals break, you got emails on one side. You've got, uh, uh, you know, uh, an audio tape of Trump talking about women. I mean, all this stuff comes out, and it affects the polls from day to day. Okay? So I think the reality is, guys, no matter what methodology they're using right now, you can't trust these polls. You can get an idea, but you can't really trust them. Okay? If you get likely voters, okay, do tracking polls, watch for trends, you got a better chance, okay. But it, it's uh, it's very difficult business, and it's gotten harder as technology has improved, okay. So um, that's the basics of polling, okay, and that's this is how you get your margin of error, okay. One over the square root. I'm sorry. How do you get that? Uh, it's just it's statistics. So if you're looking for a margin of error of a poll, but you could use this in practical matters, uh, margin of error, and how you know steel bends or you know the flexibility. You, you just throw all those statistics in, and you look for a margin of error of where you're at. Can you see how that would be used so this in, a, just, this in a practical matter? Yeah. So the equation just follows. I think I think it just follows a trend. Maybe they uh, practice and they find the equation that was perfectly followed. Now what's not cool, perfect? But now what's cool about this website and why people go to Real Clear Politics is this. So if I click on this. This shows me all the different polls. So you've got The Economist, Rasmussen, Harvard Harris, Gallup, IDTIPP, Reuters, 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 uh, PPP, CNN, Marist, Fox News. These are all Trump approval polls. Now they have the dates, okay? And what the <clears throat> real clear politics does is they average all of these. So like if you're looking at a presidential election and we click on that. Uh, I can find that. Um, Do you approve of Trump right now? Can you vote yes or no on, on your approval? Well, you can choose how to answer to John. Well, I'm really, you know, obviously really disappointed in the $1.3 trillion dollar omnibus. Um, vote him out. <coughs> we got to wait till 2020 for that. Now, Congress, yeah. Hey, even if we impeach him, we can just finish. 
doesn't necessarily mean he has to be locked in home. That's his fault. I mean, like, there's a date. I'm pretty. I mean, Mr. Bill, right. Bill Clinton. If someone is impeached, I mean, like, there, there's a, a specific date set for when they have to leave, right? Bill Clinton I mean, did leave office. I mean, like, I'm pretty sure that's the thing, like, they have to leave before they're impeached, right? If you're impeached. No, 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 no. Uh, we'll get to this, but impeachment, all that means is to formally accuse. Okay, that's done by the House. Okay, and that's just a majority vote in the House. Okay, to impeach. That means to formally charge the president hey, with a political crime. It's This is not, impeachment is not a criminal trial. It's a political trial. Then it goes to the Senate. The 100 senators are the jury. To convict in this political trial, you got to have two thirds. Okay, so that makes it a very high threshold. So two presidents have been impeached: Andrew Johnson, who took over for Lincoln, and Bill Clinton. Okay, neither one were convicted. They were both impeached, but not convicted. They were formally accused, but not convicted. And they resigned before conviction. Neither one of them resigned. Nixon resigned before, before he was impeached. So, wait, so like, even if you impeach him, they don't leave office? Correct. Oh. Unless they're, that's they're, what's the point of impeachment? That's be convicted. Yeah. If they're convicted, they have to leave office. Yes. Oh, okay. It's like an expulsion. They're out. removed from office. Removed from office. There you are. Okay. That's, okay. I guess that now, members of Congress, impeached. members of Congress cannot be impeached. They can be expelled by the other members. How do you go about that? Most of the time you get what's called censure, which is a slap on the wrist. You were bad. There's nothing to it. How do you spell it? Uh, it's a two-thirds vote in, in the wow. Bible. So if they all really hate one guy, <laughs> they can expel her. We have a, the, each, each house has an ethics committee. Okay. So if one of the members is unethical, uh, they can, usually they'll just censure them, which is basically a statement by the other members of Congress saying that you have behaved poorly, and uh, it's on official record. That you have behaved poorly. Yes. With unofficial record. Wait, wait, wait. So let, let me give you an example. Like, uh, yeah, what's an example of a censure? Uh, when, when Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House, the most powerful member of the House, he was censured. Uh, there used to be a rule that you could not, like if you were an attorney, you weren't allowed to be an attorney while you were serving in Congress. You couldn't do your day job and that full-time job as a member of Congress. And that you could not uh, make money from those other sources because of conflicts of interest and so forth. Well, Newt Gingrich wrote a book oh, yeah, he called does. Contract with America. And it sold millions of books, and he made millions of dollars. 4.5. And they broke, I mean, that broke all 4.5 million. million books? Million dollars. 4.5 million dollars. And then they're like, you can't do that. <coughs> they censured him, and then they changed the rule so that members could write books while they were in office. Wow. It's called the Gingrich Rule. Yeah. So remember when that one guy... The one guy. The Why? one guy. Totally. The one like, guy. Like, beat the heck out of that other guy with the cane. Charles Sumner. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Did he get censured? I don't know. Spell. Okay. I don't teach that part of history. Do you know, Jack, did he get spelled for that? I don't know. Probably not. You get, you're going to need two-thirds. It's like the 1800s. Yeah. Like, you're just like, oh, he's getting caned. Yeah. All old <laughs> Charles, up to his old tricks. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder if I can find the 2016. Up to his old tricks. His fault. Like dueling was cane. legal, but not cane beating. He insulted his wife. But he was 90 or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he should have just ran away. I, I like to see you run through Congress while some guy's chasing you with cane, Marcus. <laughs> That's a tough job. Yeah, dog, 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 d
<laughs> I think the reason that happened is because they didn't have a flake start. It's, it's their fault. They came to school that day. They knew it was good. Hey, hey, man, it's a risk we take every single day by coming to school. Have you seen views that we so right now, hey, hey, real quick, uh, for the battle for the Senate 2018 midterm elections, okay, right now they're showing the Democrats are going to have solidly 44 seats. Republicans are going to have solidly 49 seats. There are seven seats that are up for a fight, okay? These gray ones, West Virginia, Florida, Indiana, so forth, okay? So who does this look good for? Who's going to control the Senate? Well, if you look at these states, West Virginia is a very red state. But Joe Manchin is a Democrat, okay? Joe Manchin? He's... he's, he's Probably the, the only blue, maybe one or two blue dog Democrats, conservative Democrat. Uh, Missouri, fairly red state. Now this is, can be, a blue, uh, Arizona's red, but can go blue. Nevada's blue. North Dakota tends to be red, okay? Indiana tends to be red, Florida's swing, okay? So this is the current. So if we look at the house, how many members are there in the United States House of Representatives? 100. House of Representatives. Okay. So this is where it gets tricky, okay? The Democrats think they have a shot at taking back the House, okay? Solidly 201. Republicans, 204, okay? There's 435, so a majority is 218, right? Yeah. Okay, so these are the districts. One of them is in Kansas. Okay, uh, maybe two of them in Kansas. Okay, one and four is that's us. Okay, uh, if you look at these districts, this one's currently red. So some of these are vulnerable. Okay, about 30 of them. You see the gray areas are vulnerable. Is the state of Montana its own district? Yeah, they have one member. <laughs> <laughs> any, any state that has three electoral college votes only has one member of the House. They have two senators. <coughs> you guarantee well, we're going to get into that in the next session, okay? Governors, 2018, right now, there are 33 Democratic go or Republican governors and only 16 Democrats. So right now, you got four Dems are gonna looks like they're gonna take three from the Republicans, uh, and then there's four that are up in the air. Okay. Now, what is also interesting is state houses. Who controls the state legislature? <laughs> Now, this is the most the Republicans have ever had. And this has all happened in the last 10, 12 years. Right? Uh, South Carolina, Democrats always used to control the state legislature. Okay? Florida, Democrats. Okay? Uh, Texas, Democrats controlled it forever. The South, it just took a long time for those state legislatures to turn red. But once they did... It's almost, it's almost like the modern conservatives use cultural <laughs> cultural uh, opinions to placate. It just took a while. Yes, people. yes. Um, so this is pretty interesting to look at. Um, so when you talk about uh, the power of the state legislation, we talk about Article 5 of the Constitution, Convention of the States. Okay, that thing I was supporting here in Kansas that I went to Topeka for. To change the Constitution, okay? It seems like it would be doable, but at this point, only 12 states have approved Article 5 to have a convention of the states. Okay? Why is Montana blue? What's Alaska? Why is Alaska green? <laughs> Did the Green Party win? 
Yeah, Oh, it might be independent. What? No. Whoa. Yeah, independent. Good for Alaska. Independent. How many people do they have in their uh, government? Do you believe this? State legislature of Massachusetts? Yeah, no, I looked and I was like, oh, what that's heck? crazy. What about Montana? What's going on with Maine? Yeah, Montana. South, South Carolina, you said traditionally blue. Aren't they actually red? They were blue. They switched over recently. Well, aren't they normally red in, in presidential? Law? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The state legislature, like I said, took a while for them to change. Because you're talking about people that live in your neighborhood that people know and they've been voting for for years that are in the state legislature. And so until those people retire and you get new blood and people start to pay attention to those issues that matter to them. Think we're going to get Pennsylvania? What's that? Think we're going to get Pennsylvania? Uh, I doubt it. So uh, everything is setting up for the Democrats to do well.